Welcome to this September 28, 2023 webinar recording from California Department of Healthcare Services, facilitated by WestEd. Audio descriptions have been added for people who are blind or visually impaired. Welcome. We're so glad you're all here for today's workshop, supporting student mental health through the LEA BOP. And for those of you that don't know, or as a reminder, LEA BOP stands for the Local Educational Agency Medi-Cal Billing Option Program. Next slide. We're gonna start with some introductions of who's here in the room um, from the Department of Healthcare Services and West Ed. So first, staff from DHCS and the LEA BOP operations team. So from DHCS, we have Sarah Burkowski, Monica Velasco, Stephanie McGee, and Regina Zern. Hello. And then from West Ed today, we have Jeremy Ford, myself, Lisa Eisenberg, uh, Colleen Meacham, and Hannah Dermalowski. Next slide. So the workshop goals. This workshop is part of DHCS's effort to increase understanding about the LEA box and improve program participation among LEAs. If you are new to the LEA BOP or are not yet enrolled, please note that we hosted two introductory workshops from earlier this calendar year. And those workshop slides and recordings are both available on DHCS's website. And we will drop the links to where you can find them in the chat. We won't be covering a lot of that introductory information today. Um, so if, if this is still new to you, please, please definitely, I encourage you to check out those workshops. For today's workshop, our goals are to one, help you understand the program benefits um, for supporting student mental health services through the LEA BOP. Two, to understand the specific requirements for mental health practitioners delivering services to students. And then three, to help you understand the differences between LEA BOP covered services for special education and general education students. Next slide. All right, so here is our agenda for the next hour. We will begin with a discussion of program benefits that will walk you through the benefits of participating in the LEA BOP, as well as some program changes that enhance those benefits of program participation, particularly for covered mental health services. Then we will go over covered mental health services so you have a better sense of the types of mental health services you may already be providing to students that are eligible for reimbursement through this program. Then we will go over some requirements and best practices which will cover what you should make sure you're doing to comply with the program. Then we will pause to answer questions. We will start by answering questions received through registration. We got a lot of them. And if there's time, we will answer questions that come in through the chat. And then finally, we will close out today's step session with some next steps that you can take. So we wanna encourage you to use the chat field to submit questions throughout this workshop. We have folks monitoring and noting the questions submitted via chat and we'll either respond during today's training or in writing after today. And then presentation slides and a recording will be posted on DHCS's website in the future and participants will be notified via email when they're available online. Next slide. This is an LEA BOP 101 refresher. I know I said we wouldn't be covering introductory information, but this is just a quick recap overview of LEA BOP. So for those of you that are new to the program, this is just a quick summary um, to review how the program works and how LEAs receive funding through it. The graphic on the slide is a super simplified overview of the process, but walking from left to right, first, LEAs deliver services through allowable practitioners employed or contracted with the LEA. Then LEAs submit claims to Medi-Cal for covered services. Then LEAs receive interim reimbursements for those allowable services throughout the school year. 
Then after the conclusion of the school year, LEAs reconcile the actual cost of delivering services with the interim reimbursements they've received, the interim claims you've received throughout the year through what is known as the cost report. Those actual costs are then audited to verify that they are allowable expenditures. And this process concludes with a final audited payment within three years of the submitted cost report. Again, this is a quick overview and I really encourage you to check out those two workshops we hosted earlier this year for more details about the mechanics of the program. Next slide. Now I will turn it over to my colleague, Jeremy, who will go over the program benefits and provide, provide details about covered mental health services in this program. Hi, uh, okay, thank you, Lisa. So there are many uh, program benefits to participating in this program for LEAs. First, the program provides LEAs with an ongoing funding source for some of the school health services many of you are already providing to students. Additionally, due to a number of new one-time state and federal investments focused on student mental health, you may be adding services or building out staffing based on that one-time funding. This program provides a way to sustain those investments after the one-time funding runs out. Now is the perfect time to build out your LEA BOP participation. For example, your LEA may be hiring school counselors or school social workers with the Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program, SBHIP. Um, some of those uh, psychosocial services and assessments provided by those staff are eligible services for billing under LEA BOP. Second, because this is a cost-based reimbursement program, LEAs are reimbursed for the reasonable actual cost of providing allowable mental health services to students on Medi-Cal. Think of this a little like a travel reimbursement. It's the difference between reimbursing someone for the actual price of their lunch while traveling within reason and with documentation like a receipt versus a per diem. Depending on where you're traveling, your lunch may cost uh, your lunch cost may be higher or lower than the per diem rate. This program is like the first example, reimbursing you for the actual cost. Next slide, please. Uh, program enhancements. The program actually changed uh, a couple of years ago, and those changes improved the benefits of the program's uh, participation, particularly for mental health services that are now uh, available to those in the general population with a care plan. A couple of years ago, the program expanded to include additional practitioner types, such as associate marriage and family therapists, and more recently, the expanded scope for credentialed school counselors. Also, the program expanded to reimburse for covered services identified in a care plan, such as IHSP or a 504. Why this is important? Uh, through hiring new staff, many of you are from LEAs that have expanded mental health services for all students. So, uh, so long as you comply with the program and billing requirements, so those decision. recent enhancements of the program um, could help you receive additional Medi-Cal reimbursement for services provided to new mental health staff. Covered services. On this slide, you will see two broad categories of covered services in this program that are assessments and treatments. The provider manual includes a section on psychological and counseling services that includes much more information about these services, but I will summarize them here. Assessments include psychological and psychosocial assessments, as well as screenings. These screenings include EPSDT screenings, which stands for Early and Periodic Screenings, Diagnosis, and Treatment. Categories of EPSDT screenings are highlighted in the American Academy of Pediatrics Bright Futures periodicity schedule. Additionally, screenings also include the Adverse Childhood Experience, or ACEs screening. There's a policy and procedure letter, or a PPL, that details information about reimbursement for EPSDT and ACEs screening. Uh, we'll be dropping a link in the chat to that PPL. Uh, treatments include psychological and counseling services, which can be provided individually or in group settings. 
treatments must be included in the care plan, such as an IEP, IFSP, 504, or IHSP. Next slide, please. What is an ORP? Certain treatment services, including psychological and counseling services, requires orders or referrals or prescriptions by a qualified ORP practitioner. ORP stands for ordering, referring, and prescribing. A qualified ORP practitioner is a Medi-Cal designation that someone needs to actively sign up for. Uh, qualifications to be an ORP practitioner include signing up as a qualified ORP practitioner and registering for a national provider identification or NPI number and enrolling in Medi-Cal as an ORP provider using the provider application and validation for enrollment system or PAVE. This process can take about six months. There's a guide available online that covers this. We're including a link to that guide in the chat. Eligible practitioners. Now we're covering all the eligible practitioners that qualify to provide mental health services through the LEA BOP within their scope of practice. Those practitioners marked with an asterisk are also qualified to be ORP practitioners. I'll go, th I'll go through these on the slide. The eligible practitioners are licensed psychologists, licensed educational psychologists, credentialed school psychologists, licensed clinical social worker, credentialed school social worker, registered associate clinical social worker, <laughs> licensed marriage and family therapist, associate marriage and family therapist, credentialed school counselors, licensed physicians, licensed physician assistants, registered credentialed school nurses. And those qualified to be ORP, ORP practitioners are licensed psychologists, educational psychologists, clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists, physicians, and uh, credentialed school nurses. Next slide, please. New for credentialed school counselors, an exciting change as of January 2023, uh, credentialed school counselors can now provide psychological and counseling treatment services. Prior to January of 2023, credentialed school counselors could provide assessments and health education services. As a result of AB 2508, the scope of credentialed school counselors was expanded to allow provisions of direct mental health treatment services. As a result of California Assembly Bill 2508, amended Ed Code Section 49600, LEA BOP will now reimburse credentialed school counselors for psychology and treatment services. So I know we're getting a lot of questions about this. So this we have a slide specifically for this. So hopefully that is uh, helpful information. Uh, next slide. On this crosswalk of services, to common practitioner slide is an overview of the types of mental health services that different eligible practitioners can provide under LEA BOP. First, licensed psychologists, licensed educational psychologists, and licensed credentialed school psychologists can provide psychological and counseling treatments, psychological and psychosocial assessments, EPSDT, and ACEs screening. Then, licensed clinical social workers, credentialed school social workers, licensed marriage and family therapists, associate marriage and family therapists, registered associate clinical social workers, and credentialed school counselors can provide uh, psychology and counseling treatments, psychosocial assessments, EPSDT, and ACEs screening. Next, licensed physicians and licensed physician assistants can provide psychological counseling treatments, EPSDT, and ACEs screenings. Finally, registered credentialed school nurses can provide EPSDT and ACEs screening. Returning quickly to the ORP requirements again, all psychological and counseling treatment services must have been ordered, referred, or prescribed by 
one of those ORP practitioners. This slide will be included in the materials that we send out, so it might be a little easier to read versus um, hearing me go over it. Next slide, please. Using the provider manual, everything we have covered so far can be found in the provider manual. That will be your primary tool for understanding requirements for billing covered mental health services. There's a, uh, there's a screenshot on the slide that shows the provider manual webpage and note that there will be different section covering uh, different topics. We're, cover, uh, we're dropping a link to the webpage in the chat. Information that's included in the manual but not covered in today's uh, training are how to code different types of services for billing purposes, frequency and increment limitations of billable services. But we'll show you on the next slide how to find that information and information like it. Next slide, please. On this screen is a snapshot from the provider manual section on psychology and counseling. These tables start on page nine of the section which highlights the covered services by category. In this case, uh, the table covers IEP and IFSP assessments, the appropriate procedure codes by type and service, and the limitation of billable services. Since we're not getting into that level of detail, we're showing you where to find that uh, in the manual. Next slide, please. Finally, we want to leave you with other helpful website resources to explore on your own. This slide includes direct links to the psychology and counseling section of the LEA BOP provider manual, and it also includes a link to the billing and reimbursement overview, which contains information about overall reimbursement services and how to bill for those services. We've also included some helpful policy and procedure letters or PPLs, and these include PPL 22008R, which covers the expansion of services provided by the associate uh, social workers and the associate marriage and family therapists. And then PPL 20051, which encourages coordination of mental health services with other entities. And now we're going to finish this content by covering some requirements and best practices. This slide explains the documentation requirements for authorizing different kinds of mental health services. For screenings and assessments, there must be a recommendation by one of the following. Physician, registered credentialed school nurse, licensed clinical social worker, psychologist, educational psychologist, or marriage and family therapist. In substitution of a recommendation for assessment, a teacher or a parent may refer the student. Authorizations for EPSDT screening services will be based on the Bright Futures American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations for preventative pediatric health care, also known as the periodicity schedule. It goes by all of those names. Uh, for psychology and counseling treatments, all treatment services must be established and documented in the student's care plan. There are many more requirements to documentation that are necessary for all types of covered services. DHCS hosts documentation trainings, and those slides from past workshops are also posted on the DHCS website. Now we can dig into the LEA BOPS supervision requirements. Please note that your LEA may have different supervision and administrative requirements for directly employing or contracting with community-based practitioners that are licensed practitioners but do not hold a Pupil Personnel Services Credential, or PPSC. This requirement will cover um, the, re the requirements I will cover are for reimbursement in the LEA BOP and are really separated into two groups. The first group is associate marriage and family therapists and associate clinical social workers. Those must be clinically supervised by one of the following types of pra licensed practitioners, clinical social worker, marriage and family therapist, professional clinical counselor, clinical psychologist, or 
physician certified in psychiatry. The other group is anyone employed by the LEA without a PPSC must be supervised in their school-based activities by an individual holding a PPSC. Uh, I know some questions have come up in the chat about that, so hopefully that clears that up. Now that you know everything there is to know about the requirements, <laughs> I'm going to provide some of the best practices so you can be successful. Um, the LEABOP only reimburses costs that are eligible for federal matching funds. You actually cannot submit costs in the program that are covered by federal sources. So one example to consider is if your LEA has hired a bunch of new mental health, health staff using the federal one-time COVID relief dollars, you cannot claim for that staff's cost in this program. Because this is a cost-based uh, reimbursement program, you should not bill for practitioners that don't have eligible cost. For example, this could also include unpaid interns and practitioners that have 100% um, using federal resources. This rule only applies at 100% uh, split funding and non-100% can be included at the percentage that is not federal. If it's 50% federal and 50% non-federal, then you'll be allowed to include the 50% non-federal. You could also only bill Medi-Cal once for a service. So you want to avoid billing more than one Medi-Cal billing program and you'll wanna make sure that someone else is not billing for that service. An example of the latter is that your LEA is contracting with an organization that provides some of the LEA BOP covered mental health services to a student. If that organization is billing Medi-Cal, then you also cannot claim for those services. And very importantly, make sure you add all of the eligible practitioners to your time survey participant list. You cannot include an employed practitioner in your cost report unless they are included in your TSP list. As a matter of fact, we'll be doing a workshop on this subject October 19th at 1 p.m. I encourage everyone to attend and learn more about this important topic. I will turn it back over to my colleague, Lisa. Oh, great, thank you so much. And um, next slide. We're gonna start by first responding to some of the questions we received through the registration form. Um, and many of those are, are questions that you we have all see, also seen in the chat. So hopefully we, we will um, get have a chance to address both at the same time. We got a lot of questions requesting some of the introductory information about LEA BOP and how LEAs can participate. Lots of questions like, I just want general information or how do I enroll or what do I need to do to get started? Um, and as we've mentioned a couple times already, please check out the recording for the introductory webinar we did earlier this year. All right, now we can get into answers to your questions. So next slide. So one of the first questions we received was, what are examples of covered health education and anticipatory guidance? Jeremy, do you want to send, give the answer or do you want me to? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I was, uh, I was also just looking through the chat. There are just like a ton of really good questions. So hopefully you can see uh, we've, you know, we've selected the answers and we intentionally left a lot of time for questions. So hopefully if we answer a question that's very similar, you can kind of see the connection to what you're asking. But to answer this question, uh, we'll post these in the chat, but I'll give you a few examples here. One example is of health education and anticipatory guidance, promoting mental and emotional health, like discussing symptoms of anxiety and depression, preventing violence and intentional injury, providing information about the benefits of healthy lifestyles and practices, and so we'll go ahead and post the kind of more complete list in the chat, but those are just some examples of what's covered under health education and anticipatory guidance. Great, thank you. All right, next question was, was are risk assessments billable? 
Yeah, that's a good question. We got quite a few questions very similar to this, but the answer is that we defer to the guy that we talked about earlier, the American Academy of Pediatrics and Bright Futures periodicity schedule. So that's that's going to contain the information on risk assessments. And I think it's really important to use that guide and use that schedule because that's what's providing you with the information that you need to like justify the service in terms of billing, if I'm saying that correctly. And it covers some assessments like tobacco, alcohol, drug use, depression, other risk screenings. So yes is the answer to the question, assuming that the LEH practitioners are trained in the appropriate, uh, trained appropriately in providing those assessments, uh, then they would be billable. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Um, next question we got was, and we also saw a question about this around care plans, whether they're a, a student on, in the student record or not. Um, but can you provide guidance on HIPAA and FERPA requirements and which mental health practitioners are covered under each law and whether we need to secure parental consent for Medi-Cal billing? Jeremy, do you want to take this one? Do you want me to? Oh, go ahead. You're, you're next. <laughs> so HIPAA, FERPA, consent are great questions, and that is not even an hour long presentation. I've sat through three hour long workshops on this topic. So we can't cover all the ins and outs of those in today's um, workshop and get into the nuances. We do encourage you if you're an LEA to reach out to your LEA's counsel to ask questions about HIPAA, FERPA and consent. And then we will also drop um, some helpful resources in the chat. So the California School-Based Health Alliance has a HIPAA FERPA guide on their website. We'll drop a link to that in the chat. And then also the Federal Health and Human Services and Ed Department issued a federal joint guidance on the application of FERPA and HIPAA to student health records. So we will drop links to both of those resources in the chat. Great. All right. So the next question, saw lots of these questions in the chat. So really appreciate everyone's enthusiasm. So the, the, the next question are, are board certified behavior analysts and also licensed professional clinical counselors, eligible practitioners? And if not, are there plans to include them in the next state plan amendment? Yeah, I'll take that because we also got several, several more kind of around that. And I think I saw some questions like, basically saying like they're included in other parts of Medi-Cal and or they're included with the fee schedule. And I think the the answer is as of right now, no. LPCCs and BCBAs are not eligible practitioners under LEA BOP, but that's the current status. But DHCS is taking in these recommendations and including these roles in future program expansions. So it's not something that can just be done immediately. But it definitely the message came through in the registration questions for this workshop and the live questions. So thank you everybody for sending that in because um, I think that's how this information gets, gets shared. So short answer, not right now. Long answer, they're definitely going to work on that. Great, thank you. All right, next slide. More questions from registration. Are LEAs able to bill for educationally related mental health services, otherwise known as ERMS, and ERMS clinicians? Yes. So, so long as the uh, billed services follow all the same program requirements of documentation and the services are medically necessary. So we will, again, drop another link in the chat about the e-blast. And while we're on the topic of dropping links, I did see someone ask if we could put all of the links. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do that in the follow-up email. Great suggestion. Thank you. All right. Next question. Do general education students need a diagnosis to bill for covered treatment services? So the short answer is no. Uh, diagnosis is not required to bill. However, there's a couple points to clarify the nuance of that, which is to reiterate what's already been covered. You do need an ORP and a care plan that documents the need for covered treatment services. And I think that also answers another question that came up in the chat, which we may or may not be able to get to. So I'll just say it here, which is, yeah, you don't need an IEP to bill for general ed students for counseling services. If that message came through, then that was uh, not clear on our part. So, and then the other requirement uh, to answer this question is, 
to submit a Medi-Cal claim, you must include an ICD-10 diagnosis code. But in cases where services are provided due to like a suspected mental health disorder that's not been diagnosed, then there are options in the ICD-10 diagnosis codes, such as the Z codes for unspecified disorders. So hopefully, Jennifer, that also answers your question that you just dropped in about whether a care plan requires a diagnosis. So you should use those Z codes or other codes for an unspecified diagnosis. All right, last question from registration um, is what are some recommendations for electronic health records or EHRs and or processes to submit claims and document services? So although neither is required to participate in the program, many LEAs use some type of electronic system to document services. And some LEAs work with billing vendors, which can either provide the software or consulting or a level somewhere in between those two things. One suggestion is to reach out to your neighboring LEAs that participate and see what they're using. So we wouldn't be able to provide recommendations, but it is very common and normal that LEAs partner with some third party to help administer this program. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, now we're going to move on to the questions that we are getting from the chat. We'll go on to this question, which Jeremy, I, I think we've answered in the content, but let me just ask this question. What specific services for PPS credentialed school counselors are not covered? I think, I, I think what, what would be better way is to phrase it as what are covered. And DHCS mentioned that risk assessments were not covered. And so we did just answer the question about risk assessments, so long as they are an assessment that is included in the periodicity schedule, um, and some assessments are. And then you can find, I, we, we would refer you back to that crosswalk of services to practitioner types in the slide earlier that covers which services a credentialed school counselor can provide. But it does include counseling services where before it was just assessments and health education. So that's okay. Um, we will include, Kaylee, just I see your question in the chat. We will include a link to the periodicity schedule in our follow-up email, making a note of that right now. Next question we got was, will there be any changes to ERMS IEP services being billed? Um, we did mention that an e-blast did go out from DHCS regarding the an update to the ERMS policy. It, it came out um, earlier in September, earlier this month. We just dropped a link to the in the chat. And there's some guidance in there around how to respond to if, if your ERMS practitioners were dropped in this past year. Is there anything, Jeremy, that you want to add around ERMS eligibility? Not to that, no. Okay. No, I can take on the next one, though, about the care plan. Great, thank you. Yeah. So uh, several questions in the chat, and this this one I think kind of covers a lot of that. So hopefully this answers several people's questions, which is, the question is, clarify if the care plan, care plan must be titled an IEP, 504, IHSP, what is the standard for a plan to qualify as an approved care plan? So this, this comes down to more of that like clinical model of operating. So DHCS has left has left the door um, kind of open in terms of the phrasing. So that's why it's it's a care plan. So th from the manual, it actually says, um, uh, it says it must be an IEP, an IFSP or an IHSP, Individualized Health Service Plan. And then they say other common names for the IHP uh, include, but are not limited to uh, school health care plan, a plan of care, treatment plan, nursing plan. The intention is to allow flexible at the LEA level. And I can say just from my experience working at an LEA, the the, the way that I, I was able to get a model, because I know there are some questions like, what, is, what does a care plan look like? Uh, the way I was able to get a model was going to the nursing department and saying, what do you include in your care plan? because it, it might have many names and you might already have a plan, but it's essentially it's essentially a, a plan of care for the student. And that's what's used as the basis for this, this documentation requirement. And we have another 
we have a link here to that section of the provider manual. Uh, so I can I can put that in here that that talks about specifically the plan of care. It it's it's flexible in terms of the terminology or in terms of exactly what it might look like. It's inflexible in terms of what it must include. But if you're doing a clinical plan of care at your LEA anyways, it's going to have the information that you're going to need. And the manual will go into some of those details. Um, but I would just start with your nursing department and say, what do you guys use? What do you, what's your health care plan when it's not an IEP? Um, I think this is, we only have time. No. Okay. Sorry. We have five more minutes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to ask, I'm going to move us a little bit around. Um, I think this is an important clarifying question to um, answer regarding uh, LPCCs or APCC. So the question is, if an license, an LPCC or APCC have the PPS in school counseling, does this allow them to bill for service if they are not hired as a school counselor, but working in the capacity of mental health? Jeremy, do you want me to answer that? Um, yes. The answer is, but no, unfortunately, the provider lists the allowable practitioners um, that are eligible for reimbursements under the LEA BOP. So if the practitioner, like an LPCC, is not listed, then it is not an allowable practitioner. Uh, DHS, please correct me if I'm wrong. If they, if this person is functioning as a light, as a credentialed school counselor, which it doesn't sound like in this scenario, in this question, the LPCC is, the LPC, LPCC is functioning as an LPCC. But if if this person, this this licensed person, is functioning as a school counselor, then they would a credentialed school counselor, then they would be billable. But Regina, I see you come on, so please. Please clarify if, I, if I've gotten that wrong. It's important to remember LEA BOP is a Medicaid program, and so all of our um, practitioners have to be not just operating in a certain title at the school site, but meeting the requirements to be a Medicaid and specifically an LEA BOP provider. So as we've mentioned earlier, these are not currently listed in our state plan for LEA BOP. So regardless of what their function or title is at the school level, and LPCC cannot currently bill. And so what you started off with, it's the provider manual that lists those qualified practitioners that can bill at this time. Um, we definitely hear the concern and um, it's super important with the all the efforts to expand our behavioral health workforce. So it is a priority to look for ways that we can expand and enhance um, the number of practitioners that are available. So we understand that and appreciate it, um, but we also have to operate within compliance of our state plan. So thank you for that question and opportunity to clarify. Yeah, thank you, Regina. Got a question regarding what about nurse practitioners? Good question. Licensed registered nurses are qualified practitioners under the LEA box. Um, you should check out the provider manual. There is a section on nursing services that lists the procedure codes and service limitations for what is allowable. This webinar did not cover all of the eligible practitioners under LEA BOP because it is really focused on the uh, services under the mental health category, the mental health umbrella. So um, they are uh, uh, registered nurses, are licensed registered nurses are qualified practitioners in the program. So definitely check out the provider manual. All right, do we have time for two more questions? A question we got, I think is important chance to clarify um, was a question, did you say in lieu of a mental health ORP, a parent or teacher can submit a referral? Let me start Jeremy and see if you wanna add in any clarification. I want, it's really important to understand we go back to that slide earlier that had the two buckets of categories, you have assessments and screenings and treatments. The ORP and the care plan are all requirements for documenting treatment services. And the referral, the referral that we mentioned is for a parent or teacher is for a, a referral, documenting a referral for an assessment or screening. But Jeremy, let me know if I got that right. Yeah, that sounds right. It's important to distinguish the requirements for assessments, screenings, and then treatment services separately. 
All right, I think we have time for one more question. What's going to be the lucky question? Do we want to? Um, yeah. We. I know we said we weren't going to really go into it too much, but we've got a lot of questions around this, around uh, SB HIP or or billing under both programs. This this idea, I can touch on it a little. Great. Yes, please. Can you okay. ask the it's, question that you want to answer? Yeah. So the, yeah. So the question is. SB HIP is suggesting mental health staff in our district sign up under CYBHI and bill under LEA BOP. You know, is this correct? Another question similar to that was, um, you know, that the fee schedule has, allows for practitioners that LEA BOP doesn't um, and kind of different things like that. I would say we are providing those resources that we mentioned, including kind of a YouTube video. Uh, from CYBHI, but I would just generally say there are different programs in Medi-Cal that require different things and provide different benefits. And so the, it, one is not always the right thing for every individual service provider or even for an LEA. So that process of distinguishing what you will be billing, especially going forward, is, is going to be kind of an individual decision based on your LEA and what your needs are. Um, back to a previous slide we mentioned though, you can never bill twice for the same service. That's that's a Medi-Cal rule, like that's not gonna change. So I'm not discouraging anybody for signing up for CYBHI or anything like that, um, but just, just recognize as you go forward, these conversations will continue about what you're billing when and where. And it's not to say that one is better than the other. These are all programs that I think we're all hoping can work together for the benefit of the LEA and ultimately for the students that are getting the services. So I hope that kind of clears that up. It's really big picture, which is to say, I can't tell you today what this individual person will be doing or what program they will be billing, be, be, be billing a year from now. That's good. There's a lot more uh, factors involved. All right, thank you, Jeremy. That concludes our Q&A for, um, this has been really great. Thank you so much, everyone, for your wonderful questions. Next slide. Which brings us to next steps and closing for today's webinar. Uh, next slide. So we have lots of resources for support. Um, throughout today, we showed or described a number of resources. We've dropped links in the chat. We'll keep track of all of those and we will add them to the follow-up email that comes out after today's webinar. There are a number of resources available on the LEA BOP website that should be your source materials for understanding mental health services covered by this program. Please refer to the provider manual, especially the section on psychology and counseling. DHCS also hosts quarterly stakeholder meetings. Information is available online from past meetings and we're dropping a link into the chat as well. Um, and the best way to know when these meetings are happening is to sign up for the email subscription list. And we're dropping a link on how to do that as well. And then um, we encourage you, lots of great questions came in. If you want more um, individualized support and you have a number of questions you wanna get through, we encourage you to sign up for a technical assistance for technical assistance with the Department of Healthcare Services, and we're including a link in um, the chat to the technical assistance and site visit request form. Next slide. We also have a ton of workshops coming your way. So next month on October nineteenth at one p.m., we will have a workshop on LEA BOP and the Time Survey Participant or TSP list. Registration is now open and we'll drop a link in the chat on how on where you can register for that. We also have workshops in November about a workshop in November about coordinating with and billing for contractors. Then in December and January, we'll be hosting two workshops that address the unique needs of small and rural LEAs. In December, we'll do an introductory workshop on the LEA BOP with uh, specifically for small and rural LEAs, followed by a workshop in January that covers setting up a consortia, which can be a really helpful strategy for small LEAs to participate and share the administrative responsibilities for program participation. 
And then in February, we will have an onboarding workshop for new LEA BOP coordinators. So if you're responsible for managing this program for your LEA, this is going to be a workshop for you. And we hope lots of you will join us for some of those upcoming trainings. Next slide. And that, that concludes our today, today's workshop. We really appreciate your participation. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned something. Um, thank you for all your wonderful questions. And we really, again, appreciate all your time today and uh, look forward to seeing you on some of the next workshops. Thank you so much. Thanks.